Um, I'm Raymaker. I think most of you know me. Um, I, I write a sports technology blog, and I'll probably explain a little bit about that in a moment here. Um, I think it's my fourth time presenting here, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to be back again and, and talking to all of you, um, both here in front of the presentation as well as uh, just on the side and all the meetings that we've had over the last uh, couple of days. So I think it's, it's probably fun to start with a bit of numbers. Um, $822 million a year. That's the rough purchasing influence of, of what I'm writing about. Um, that's, that's how much product people are on average buying each year after reading reviews on the blog. So you may wonder how I get to that number. Um, so over the last 12 months, as of yesterday morning, there was 4.1 million unique product review views on the blog. Um, that means that if you came and read one product review and you read four more, you only counted once, no matter how many times you came in that 12-month period. Um, so it's, I'm only counting you once, which means the, the numbers start to get a bit low. I'm only assuming that you bought a $200 product, or maybe you didn't. It's purchasing influence. Maybe you didn't buy a product. Um, of course, many of the products in this room are, are a lot more than that. Um, three to $400 is probably a bit safer estimate. Um, and then there's things like power meters and trainers that run up into the thousands of dollars. No, but that just gives you kind of a, a feel for, for what, what I'm writing about and, and how it might matter to, to you as companies. Um, and it also doesn't include um, things like RSS feeds or posts that may talk about your products that aren't technically what I call product review posts. So these are just posts that are pure in-depth product reviews um, and the total numbers from those posts alone. So who am I? So outside of that, um, so as most of you know, this isn't actually my day job. Um, so I have a, a day job outside of this. I design data centers um, for a, a large technology company. Um, so I, I basically travel the world every single week. I'm in a different country, different continent. Um, you know, as, as Catherine joked uh, the other day, I, I'm kind of working almost 24-7. So you can probably catch me no matter what time zone you are. Um, and I'm, you know, outside of that, I'm, I'm like most other athletes, like most of you. I'm, I'm running, I'm swimming, I'm cycling. Um, you know, I, I love to travel, I love to race, um, and I love to eat cupcakes. So um, my wife has a cupcake shop in, in Paris where we moved to last summer. Um, so even though my name is DC Rainmaker, the blog name, um, we actually now live in, in France and have done that since uh, last summer. So the, the blog started over six years ago now, um, almost exactly six years ago. Of course, most of you know from in-depth sports technology reviews, um, but in reality, I, I write about a lot more than that. Um, on any given week, I may only do one review, um, if that, maybe once every one or two weeks, just because of how long and complex they are. Um, so a lot of the other content is around just sports in general, um, and dirt sports in particular, um, but it's also about me and my life. I'll, I'll include things like travel and and where I run or where I ride or, or just anything at all that seems interesting to me. And that's kind of where it started out six years ago, like most personal blogs of, of athletes and that they're talking about their journey to a given race. Um, and I think that's one of the things that keeps it most interesting um, to, to new readers as well as uh, readers that have been there for, for multiple years. When I look at the numbers and I do a survey every year, a, a reader survey, um, and you know, there's 30% of the people have read the blog more than two years, which is a long time in the internet world um, to have people there that long. Um, about 1.7 million page views a month is the average, about 800,000 of that is unique. Um, about 15,000 or so RSS subscribers. It's a little bit harder to measure that now without Google Reader anymore, um, but that's kind of a, a rough estimate. Um, 14,000 Twitter and Facebook followers both. Um, and I continue to see growth every single month. Um, it's funny, I did that $822 million a year number um, back a month ago, just before CES, or just before, sorry, Interbike. Um, and it was, you know, 10% lower than that, um, just over that preceding 12 months. So I continue to see um, growth every single month. Now, probably the most important thing to, to you in this room here is that um, how I make money. Um, and the reason that's important to you is because I want you to understand that um, I don't take advertising dollars from anyone in this room. Um, so uh, I, the blog is supported via two ways. One is affiliate links, which means that if you like a product and you go onto Amazon or some of the other partners that I have and, and buy through those companies, um, then you can support the blog that way. But I don't personally care whether you buy product X or product Y, it doesn't matter to me, um, or if you don't buy anything at all. And then I have Google AdSense for ads, um, which means, as I kind of explained yesterday to a smaller group, you know, if you're looking for laundry machines, you're going to see laundry machine ads, and if you're looking for lingerie, you're going to see lingerie ads. Um, I, 
don't really control that. If I, if I find sports technology products that are in those ads, um, I actually proactively block them. So I just, I don't want your advertising dollars and it's as simple as that. Um, so who are, who are the readers? Where do they come from? Um, about 48% is from the US and Canada, 40% uh, in Europe, um, and the remainder around the world, but high concentrations in Australia, New Zealand, um, as well as South Africa, um, obviously English speaking. Um, languages kind of dominate there quite a bit, um, but I really have readers everywhere. I um, mean, you know, down in South America, Brazil, a lot of readers there. Um, really, everywhere um, except China for the most part, because I'm blocked in China. So um, <laughs> I get I get a lot of readers from just about everywhere, um, which is a challenge, by the way, when you travel to China to write um, and get to the blog. So. Um, who is the reader, though, from a, a demographic standpoint? Um, you know, I get uh, the wide range of folks. Um, I get people who wouldn't know which way to install a heart rate strap on themselves. Um, I mean, literally, I have requests on how to best, you know, hook up a heart rate strap on someone, um, all the way to people with PhDs on heart rate technology. Um, it's literally that entire gamut of, of people. Um, you know, from a, a skill set standpoint, there are Olympic, Olympic medalists. Um, gold medalists, there are uh, professional athletes, um, and then there's folks that are just trying to lose weight, um, that don't know anything about sports technology, um, they can't run 1K, um, let alone run, you know, 140 miles or you know, anything like that, um, and they're just trying to understand how to use this technology to make themselves um, healthier. Um, outside of, you know, sports people, um, I'm followed by a lot of financial analysts. I talk with a lot of financial analysts. Um, I have conference calls with companies that are doing industry research um, that are looking to invest. Um, I talk with those folks and give them kind of my perception of the industry, and you'll see a lot of that over the next uh, hour or so. Um, mainstream media publications, so that's, you know, Washington Post, The Guardian, um, big, big um, mainstream publications, and then of course technology publications like Engadget, Gizmodo, TechCrunch, etc. Um, and then finally sports publications, so Runner's World, Bicycling, all that kind of crowd um, are following what I'm, what I'm running about here. Um, and then there's you, right? At the end of the day, there's, um, you are a huge audience in, in that, um, in my daily readership, and, and you're all reading about what I write about, and um, you know, it's, it's funny to hear, you know, one company reads about a product announcement about another company, and uh, I know that you're diving back in, into the details on that, and, and um, so that's certainly a, an aspect of my audience. Um, but I think it's probably to, to keep, in, keep in mind the most important thing for me is the general consumer. So when I write product reviews, I'm writing them for them. I'm not writing them for the rest of these people here that aren't them. Um, so when I'm talking about whether a product is good or bad, I'm focusing on their viewpoint not necessarily your viewpoint. So let's talk about trends a little bit. Um, you know, I think before we go into that, it's probably important to point out pricing. Um, if we look at pricing about, you know, kind of three topic areas in sports technology, first is GPS devices, next is um, trainers and power meters. I just kind of pick three ones that are high priced items. Um, and just over the past, you know, three to four years, we've seen these, these prices completely drop out, right? We've talked about GPS devices three or four years ago, um, the average price was between two and four hundred, or sorry, three and four hundred dollars. Um, now, the $99 or hundred dollar GPS device is commonplace. I mean, that's, you can get GPS devices plus or minus 30 bucks on a hundred dollars um, that are good devices. Um, and, you know, even the devices that were $99 a year ago are now selling for $69 right now. So, that's a huge shift over the course of just a few years. The same thing for trainers. We saw trainers, you know, if I went back five years ago, a computer controlled trainer was the Compu Trainer at $1,640. Um, and while the Compu Trainer is still $1,640, the rest of the marketplace has dropped the price considerably. Um, now we see the Be Cool at $650 US and, and a, a whole range of products in between that. Um, and it doesn't mean that the quality has dropped. In fact, I would argue that the, the products that are $1,000 today in the trainer market are just as good, if not far better, than the products that are $1,640. Um, so just the products, the pricing has gone down. Um, and the same with power meters. You know, we've seen, especially over the last year, but really the last few years, this continued drop in prices from um, $2,000 plus um, down to now direct force power meters of $699 and ones that you know, even just a few months ago, the beginning of the summer, um, were twelve and thirteen hundred dollars, and now are eight hundred dollars. Um, so we're seeing that pricing, and I think we're going to continue to see that pricing drop across the marketplace. 
So let's talk about trainers since that's, that's here first. Um, this is probably the technology I am most excited about um, from an AMP Plus standpoint. Um, I think we're going to see the most innovation here. I think we're going to see um, the biggest change in the marketplace here come from trainers. Um, and the reason is that today we all have these separate islands. Every single company that's making a trainer has an island of hardware and an island of software. Um, and they don't work together. Um, in fact, half the time they don't even work by themselves together. Um, so getting them out and saying that I can take hardware company X and software company Y and make them mesh is huge. Um, especially when you start to look at some of the third party applications and you, and you merge that with things like the app stores on, on Apple and Android and any other platform out there, um, it makes it so much easier for consumers to adapt and adopt software um, and go and, and try something out. They can try out an application now and say, yep, I'll use that. It's only 10 bucks for the application or 20 bucks um, versus these big monolithic software suites that cost $200 in the past. Um, on the, the hardware side, that means that companies can now focus on making better hardware. Um, there are some trainer companies that make really good hardware and make really bad software. Um, and I think it's, this gives them the opportunity to go ahead and to say, you know what, we're going to focus on the hardware, making kick-ass hardware, and we're going to let the entire ecosystem take advantage of, of the AMP Plus connectivity for controlling trainers. Uh, you gr group riding is kind of a funny thing. Um, today in cycling, group riding within a, a trainer standpoint really sucks. Like there's just not a good way to do it. Um, the only option out there today that's, that's widely available is to do copy trainer multi-rider within a given facility um, and that's it. There's a couple of, of what I would call almost tangent applications out there that can do you know internet based stuff and things like that but every single one of these solutions requires that you have the same physical hardware um, for the trainer in order to make them equal anyways. Um, there's a couple solutions out there that you know can merge speeds and things like that, but that doesn't really equalize the, the field. Um, so going to a, a method that allows us to say I can take a Wahoo kicker and somebody can compete against um, a person with a tactics trainer in Europe and doing that across the board, um, that's going to be massive. Um, and it's going to really kind of explode that whole scene. I'd say the one challenge though in that area for you is to find a way to take advantage of the multiplayer aspects without making it siloed per company. Um, so if you look at, at platforms like Xbox or something like that, they have many game developers on that same platform um, and allows them to take advantage of the scale of that platform. Um, whereas if you're going and developing a single software development, or sorry, a single application um, that's competing just for that application, you're not going to be able to take advantage of the rest of the people out there on different applications that want to multi play multiplayer games. So I would, I would encourage you as, a, as an industry to look at how you can work together in the same way you work together at 7.30 this morning in the room next door to develop the spec. Do that on the back end side of software so that you can go ahead and, and you know, make the number of people doing multi-rider scenarios uh, increase quite a bit. Um, I think probably the last point is most important here, and I think those that are in the trainer room or in the trainer industry know this already. Um, if you don't adopt this specification, you'll be left behind. It's as simple as that. Um, if you don't adopt the, the ability to, uh, to work with other devices, people aren't going to buy your devices. I mean, we're seeing that already within um, the space for those devices that um, aren't interrupting, um, interoperating with other, other software suites. So power. Um, I think it's safe to say that for once, we can say that this year was actually the year of the power, power meter. I think over the last a lot of years, um, people have said this is the year of the power meter, and then they say it again next year, and they say it again the year after. Um, I'm reasonably confident that we can actually say that 2013 was the year of the power meter. We saw a new entrance um, that, that bottomed out the price range. Um, we saw a new entrance at the high end um, of the price range. We saw entrance in the middle of the price range. Um, we saw companies that have been talking about getting a power meter out for a long time, get the power meter actually out into the marketplace. Um, there is a wide range of, of power meters available today from again, 699 up to many thousands of dollars. Um, this, is, this is the year. Now, of course, will adoption increase over the next few years? Absolutely. But I think this is finally the year where we've hit that critical mass of options across the range of the spectrum that, that people can go ahead and start looking at power. Um, and like I talked about earlier though, pricing is going to go, continue to go down. Um, if you don't believe it's going to continue to go down, you're only fooling yourself because um, just like every other industry, it's got to drop. Adoption is going to increase, price is going to go down. Um, now the, the challenge with power though is that it's still about watts. 
um, which is great for people in this room and great for a, a chunk of my readers, um, but it's not great if you want to increase adoption of your product um, because people don't really understand watts. People still think that I can compare 200 watts between a 120 pound rider and 200 watts between a 300 pound rider and that they're equal and that they're not. And then we say, well, we talk about watts a kilogram and, and of course that's where people get lost. Um, so we need to do some of the same stuff that we've done around heart rate training um, within the power meter world. You know, if you look at what, what Polar does around heart rate training, what they've done for the last 10 years, for example, um, they've simplified that. You know, users don't know anything about what their heart rate is or about zones or any of that kind of stuff. They look at the device and the device tells them every single day what their workout should be. Um, and they've done a good job at that and that's where they've, they've been able to go ahead and push that market forward around heart rate training. I think that same sort of thing needs to happen around power. It needs to be easier for folks to understand, and they need to know how to, how to train by it as well. Um, it shouldn't just be going out and, and getting the biggest power number on a given, given ride every single day. I think there's still a lot of potential, though, for, for high-end use cases out there that aren't solved yet. You know, I know a lot of those were talked about yesterday in the, the power meter technical working group. Um, I think it's important that those those ideas that were talked about there move forward, even if the how we're using it or what we're doing with it use cases aren't solved yet. Uh, meaning that high speed data is a good example of that. Um, there's a lot of talk around, you know, what can we do with high speed data and power? Um, and, and yeah, there are some use cases that are small, um, but I think we'll find that over time, if we enable those use cases technically, then, then the smart people, the scientists of the world can go ahead and take advantage of those use cases and do something with that data and tell us how to train by it better. Um, just like it was power 15 or 20 years ago, and heart rate before that, it's the same thing here. Just like we look at now left-right power, you know, if we stand here today, I don't think anyone in this room knows exactly how to train by left-right power or what we should do with left-right power yet, but we know that it could be valuable down the road and that, that process of research and, and development starts with getting it into mass market. Um, of course, that's gonna take coordination between not only the power meter units, but also the head units and the software behind it. Um, you know, we were talking last night with, with Jim from Quark, um, you know, it's not something where you can sit there and, and make it happen on the, the power meter side um, without the head units supporting high speed data and without the applications behind the scenes supporting high speed data. It takes this entire room here to make sure that that scenario um, gets illuminated. So activity trackers. Um, the activity tracker market is is massive in potential. Um, you only had to walk through CES this past year to see that. If you if you walked into the kind of the health and fitness pavilion, I think about half the companies there were were hawking some sort of activity tracker, um, something that you can clip on somewhere or you could do something with. Um, huge potential there. Huge potential with gamification. Um, the reality is, and we saw the, the gamification slides yesterday, um, there's actually almost nothing today that's using activity tracker data in games. Um, almost nothing. I mean, it's literally, it's astounding how much, how many Fitbits of the world out there, but nothing leveraging that. Um, you know, let's talk about what they do well. Um, I, f I think the, the biggest thing is that the Fitbits of the world just work, right? We, we look at some of the sports technology products out there today, and they're complex, they're hard to hard to use, um, Fitbits just work, and they even tell you hello, as pointed out this morning by Rick, right? They smile at you, too. Um, a lot of other products are more complex. Um, the apps are really well done. I've gotta hand it to the, that activity tracker industry. They managed to make really pretty apps. Every single one of the apps, you look at Nike Fuel, you look at Fitbit, you look at Withings, all those apps are beautifully designed apps, um, which attracts the user to using them. If you have an ugly app, the user will use it less. It's really as simple as that. Um, and there's a multitude of form factors out there today. If you like wrist-based trackers, there's wrist-based ones, there's waist-based ones, there's all sorts of ones, ones that are coming up for your, your ankle as well. I mean, it's, there's lots of options there. Um, what isn't done so well? Let me show you what isn't done so well. So, Tuesday morning I flew out here. It was probably four in the morning and I needed to wash some clothes, do some laundry. So I threw my jeans into the laundry machine at four in the morning, which was probably the biggest mistake there was. Um, a few hours later, I woke up, and I found both of these in there. Um, of course, these are, uh, one's a Fitbit, one's a Willings Pulse, um, and both are now dead, right? So they're not waterproof. Um, they're not necessarily as, as hardened as a sports technology device. Um, so in a matter of just a couple hours, I've managed to fry 200 plus dollars worth of gear. Um, 
and it's gone. And that's something that you know consumers um, fear with their phone. Um, and the same problem happens with some of these devices as well. Um, I dropped a Fitbit into a toilet in Africa once as well. Um, the same problem there too. Um, so. You know, that's something that, that, that's going to challenge the industry. I think we're seeing people already respond to that. The new Polar Loop, for example, is waterproof to 20 meters. Um, it's impressive. It's not, I mean, it's, that's, this was not waterproof to a couple inches of water in the laundry machine. So something to, something to keep in mind. Um, accuracy is often questionable. Um, the reason I was wearing two of these was I was you know, doing accuracy tests, um, and I've done some with four or five units at once. Um, and you see a a bit of a broad range between how accuracy looks between units. Um, and you've got to keep in mind that people that are wearing these are generally doing so because they want to increase health and they want to understand calories. Right? They want to understand input-output. Um, and so when accuracy is, is fluctuating 30% or more between some of these devices, then why are people using them? Because um, 30%, that's, that's a lot more of the chili that I had yesterday for lunch that I could have had um, versus you know, one or the other. Um, and they don't do sports well. Um, so none of these devices, um, I can go out for a trail run here and it'll give me anything at all useful, um, or even just a, a simple run. They're all going to give me weird data. Um, another area where, oddly enough, the, the polar loop is interesting there because it's actually the first device that bridges into the heart rate strap and says, okay, this is an activity tracker 23 hours of the day, and then the one hour a day where I go out and do something that's fitness-based, I can now pair the heart rate strap and get calorie, um, heart rate driven calorie data. Um, so that's an interesting way that they've kind of twisted that paradigm a bit. Um, of course, it's, it's beyond just some of these dedicated um, activity trackers. It's also looking at some of the ones that um, have done that in the past. I think most of us in the room would, would look at something like the Moto Active, the Motorola Moto Active that came out two and a half so years ago, um, and say that was well ahead of its time in, in so many ways. Um, and of course, the, the unit's now been discontinued and the team basically disbanded. Uh, disbanded. Um, but that, that device did activity trackers, but also could be used as a power meter. Um, and literally uh, across the board, pardon me, head unit, literally across the board it could do day-to-day -day stair steps, it could do yoga, it could do all these sort of things. Those are kind of some of the devices that people are looking for to be able to bridge those gaps, especially on the athletic side. Especially if you're selling to somebody that's already got a 300 hour GPS device, they want something that can maybe bridge that gap a little bit better. Now the challenge though with all these devices is the phone. We talk about things like um, the iPhone 5S having the coprocessor in there to be able to do motion tracking in the background. We saw yesterday with the Samsung um, health application to be able to do steps. Um, and, and of course, tracking steps in a phone is, is nothing new. It's something that folks have been doing now for a couple years. Um, but as phones get, um, you know, if processors allow that to happen without having a battery drain, um, that's going to make these sort of devices less and less appealing. Um, because people are with their phones almost 24 hours a day. I mean, outside of sleeping, your phone is generally on you the entire day. So this morning, you know, one of the things we, uh, that was talked about, Rick mentioned, was the um, activity trackers in, in insurance. Um, and I, you know, I kind of had, it gave me an opportunity. Um, and I like speaking later in the day sometimes because I can you know, look at other presenters and take little snippets of what they say and, and add it to the deck. So what I did is I, I had a, a bullet earlier that talked about the fact that with um, a lot of the insurance programs today that people are using, um, they don't have the latest devices out there. Um, so they, they have these, these programs and these devices are like from three or four years ago and people just aren't going to use something that's a clunky old device that doesn't have a connectivity. They want the latest devices. So out of curiosity, I actually went to Walgreens site and I looked up the devices that were there and was pleasantly surprised. Um, so these were the, the devices they had. This is the, a snippet from their page showing they have you know, Fitbit. Um, Body Media and Withings, and as Rick talked about, um, they're looking to expand that. Um, and I think that's that's not the onus. There isn't just on Walgreens. The onus is there is on you as companies to partner with these companies and provide more and more options. Um, so while this is a good starting point, um, this is a fraction of the potential there. Um, you'll notice there are no endurance sports products on here. There are no um, products beyond. You know, these three, there's, you're missing things like Nike and um, a lot of other companies out there. Um, so I'd like to see more partnerships there where um, the companies are providing health-based incentives um, for insurance programs and things like that to get a broader range of applications and devices. So wearable display technology. Um, there's obviously a lot of talk about this. I think the, the two main folks in the, the field today 
or recon. Um, when they, they exist, they have their current uh, snow heads up display unit that, that's targeted at snowboarders, skiers, and people who wear goggles on the snow. Um, and then they've got their recon jet that's coming out. Um, hopefully later on this year sometime, um, and probably widely available next year. And the, the jet is unique because it's got a whole slew of sensors. It's got kind of that sweet spot of, you know, Bluetooth Smart, AMP Plus, Wi-Fi. Um, it can connect across really any of those three technologies and use them in, in the areas that make the most sense. Um, and then you've got, of course, Google Glass, which is targeted at a different area of focus. It's targeted at folks that are kind of the day-to-day -day activity. It's not so much a sports unit. Um, you know, I've, I've talked with folks that have tried to use it for sport and doesn't really quite work as well in that area. Um, whereas, you know, recon definitely doesn't work as well in a conference room setting or walking around the airport. Um, so I think you're still seeing uh, quite a bit of separation there. Um, I think it's important to see where they do and don't compete. Um, for example, today recon will, will note that they don't see themselves as competing with, you know, the GoPros of the world and action cams and things like that. Um, that may be true today, but you're fooling yourself if you think that's true a year or two from now. Um, the reality is that you know, the camera in there today isn't a high quality camera. It's, it's HD, but only just barely. Um, but if you go forward two or three years, absolutely. People are going to be sitting there making a comparison between a GoPro and a, a recon unit or some other competitor that may be in that, that same category. Um, today, they depend on phones, right? You can't use Google Glass um, without a cell phone um, for any length of time. And, and the recon jet is pretty much the same way. It's depending on the phone. Um, again, one or two years from now, that's not going to be the case. They will be self-sustaining. Um, you can have one or the other. They can operate um, by themselves or, or together. Um, today, they're just starting to compete with GPS devices. Um, so, you know, recon is directly competing with a GPS, a risk-based GPS device. That's their their plan. Um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see if they can execute upon that. Um, I think you know, a lot of companies have learned it's really, really hard to compete well in this segment against the incumbents that have been there um, that understand sports technology really well. Um, I will point out that like this was a year of power, um, next year is definitely not the year of wearable displays. We have a long way to go still there. Um, you know, even if these two products actually reach um, market sometime in 2014, keeping in mind both of them are now in beta or closed beta state. Um, uh, next year, you're just going to see the beginnings of that. I think you're really talking 2015, 2016 before we start to see widespread adoption. Um, but that should be an area that I think, you know, given this room, you would be looking at um, as to how to, to tie into that, um, either a software or a hardware. Kickstarter. Um, so I mentioned Kickstarter last year. I wanted to mention it again this year. Um, you know, the, the Kickstarter motto is fairly simple in general. Um, it's overcommit, underdeliver, don't communicate, and be late. Um, that's if you do all those one, two, three, four things, um, you will rock at Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> and the good news is you'll be like everyone else at Kickstarter. Um, you know, it's funny. The, the the item I'm most excited about right now in Kickstarter. Um, has nothing to do with sports technology. It's an item that heats a pot of water, literally. It's a soy bead thing. You, you set a, a certain temperature and you put a steak in, you come back after a, a three hour run and the steak is perfectly cooked. Um, and that's the thing I'm most excited about because most of the other sports technology products on Kickstarter right now aren't doing so hot. Um, so they're meeting at least one or two or three of those items up top there, um, or they're just simply falling flat. Um, you know, it's. Kickstarter was really designed for a startup company to launch a new product. Um, it was designed for a, basically an unheard of to launch something new. Um, and what we've seen lately is that um, you know unheard of's are still there, um, and sometimes they're launching their second product, um, and sometimes they're launching products just to see if it'll even catch on. And then sometimes we have existing companies launching products they've already announced to see if they'll catch on. Um, I think if you're looking at Kickstarter, you have to be really careful about what you want to use it for, um, because if you if you enter that market the wrong way, then people may not take you seriously, um, and if you don't understand how Kickstarter works, then you're going to get burnt by it. Um, you know, I've seen companies that have gone on Kickstarter multiple times with the same product. They'll go to Indiegogo first, and then they'll go to Kickstarter, and then they'll go to some third-party platform. Um, just, I would be be aware of Kickstarter. Um, you should, if you're looking at Kickstarter and you have not yet announced a product and you're not a company that is well known, um, then I would be waiting to as close as possible to that product is ready before you announce it. Um, otherwise, people aren't going to trust you. Um, if you have timelines that show next. April or May or June, you've lost all trust. Because people know that April, May, or June really means September, January, or April of the next year, um, which is what we've seen in a lot of cases. Um, so 
just, just be aware of that. Um, one thing that's probably of, of note is um, I've changed my policy. If I have policies, like I, I don't, I'm not a corporation, I don't have written policies, but I have mental policies that I, I try to stick with. Um, one of them is on Kickstarter projects. I won't talk about Kickstarter projects unless I have a physical unit in hand um, and in terms of a standalone post. I'll make mention it in what I call my weekend review posts, but unless I've seen a product physically and can touch it, then I don't trust that the company is actually going to bring it to market on the timelines they specified. Um, and there was a case of that recently where a company w was pushing very, very hard um, for me to, to talk about their product that they had um, launching Kickstarter, well, a Kickstarter competitor over the past uh, month or so. And they said, no, it's as simple as that. I'm not going to stand up in front of readers and talk about a product that is vaporware. I mean, that's the simplest as way as you can put it. Smartwatches. So kind of a, as a follow on from Kickstarter. Um, tech blogs love to love smartwatches. It is their version of porn, right? It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Like every tech blog, every smartwatch that comes out is just, it's astounding. So the, the thing is, most smartwatches suck. Um, and that's what tech blogs don't get. Well, they get, but they, they don't necessarily communicate out very well. Um, and the, this comes from a few reasons. One is that um, tech blogs are full of tech people. They're full of geeks. They're people like me that, that can look beyond all the, the wonky things with a, a device and say, yeah, but it's still a cool device to have, right? And, and the rest of the world says, no, that's stupid, right? And that's where a lot of the smartwatches have failed thus far. Um, they're slow. They have poor battery. They have poor displays. Um, they have you know, restrictions on who they can communicate with, only with a certain handset um, or certain... Uh, software version on a certain handset, um, it's not the sort of stuff that's going to gain mass adoption the way they're being executed today. Um, but most importantly for this audience, they're not sports devices. Almost all the smartwatches today are devices that are aimed at sitting in a room like this where um, you don't want to take out your phone and you want to go ahead and look at the message that just came in. Um, very few of them are designed for the sports market. There are some coming up over the next uh, well, who knows when. Next few months, they're Kickstarter projects, so you don't really know. Um, and they're designed for sports, but whether or not they'll be able to bridge the gap between a GPS running watch that we've seen today and you know, the, kind of the rest of the market in terms of smart displays is going to be tough. Um, I think we are seeing some smart watches that you know, technically fit that category um, that are sport-focused only. Um, and that would be, I know that the Magellan Echo is one of them um, that's driven by uh, the phone. Um, and I have played with that, um, and that was is very well done. Um, that's, that's an example of a sport only. It doesn't show me my email. It doesn't show me anything else. It just shows me where I'm running based on a, on a phone app. Um, of course, this is just temporary. Um, like anything else, we're going to see convergence here. If we fast forward one or two years, we're going to see this point where um, devices are, are both a good smart display um, for day-to-day -day tasks like email and messaging and things like that, as well as being a good um, sports computer. So this is kind of an interesting area um, that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uptick in, which is subscription services and on-demand feature payments. Um, so, with the, the advent of the mobile app stores, things like Apple and Google, um, people are trusting these platforms. People um, know that they're easy to use. Um, they can go ahead and they can press a single button on their phone. They don't have to pull their credit card out. They don't have to give their, their personal information to some third party site. And they're able to go ahead and do recurring payments for things. And we're seeing this pick up the most actually in the trainer space right now, um, where apps are being developed for trainers and, and people can go ahead and do subscriptions for you know three months, six months, et cetera. Um, and then we're also seeing it um, in some of the other kind of peripheral um, areas of that as well, where people are developing apps and they want to go ahead and leverage um, these technologies. Um, I think this is an area that we can see more expansion of. Um, there's a lot of demand for people to buy features on some of the, the devices you make today. Um, leveraging that to be able to go on demand and say, I want to pay 20 bucks extra for this feature um, is something that consumers are comfortable with. Um, and if you can implement that technologically where you allow somebody to update their, their device um, through one of these, these app stores, um, I think that's a way you can go ahead and justify um, some of your existing uh, development efforts. So action cameras, um, you know, up until the last year or so, maybe even less than that, um, it's been focused just on recording plain video. 
So it's just, you know, you sit there, you get uh, a simple uh, video file of some for out, format out, um, and that's it. What we've seen over the past year with, um, for example, the Contour GPS and, and some of the other devices um, now coming out of the market over the last month is adding additional metrics. Um, so like the Verb, for example, adding in AMP plus data. Um, but we've seen also now, you know, GPS, altimeter, heart rate, speed, G-force, um, cadence, and, and that's only going to continue to expand as, as people think of more ways um, to capture metrics during a given um, activity. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of potential here for this market when you start combining those action cameras with some of the trainer pieces that I talked about earlier. Um, so right now you can do that. Um, but if you look at the, the process to do that, it's a nightmare. And you wonder nobody, why nobody does. Um, so right now, you've got to go out and record a video. Um, so you've got to go out, go for a ride and you know, run through 13 elk on the way back down again and, and come back and have your video. Then you transfer that via USB to your computer. You take it on your computer and you have to process that video using some sort of tool to either merge it or make it viable to upload somewhere else. Um, you upload it to this cloud service as part of one of these, these trainer software companies. Um, then, of course, you actually turn right around, back around and download from the cloud service because that's how you get the video onto your trainer. Um, and then you finally ride on the trainer. Why can't we shortcut that process? Why can't we find a way to go ahead and have these cameras start talking to that same trainer software and just replay that onto a device? Um, and there's some technology challenges there, no doubt, um, but all technology that you can handle in this room today. Um, this isn't beyond the scope of what we can do. It's just a matter of streamlining this process to make it more viable for folks to ride these videos um, and re recreate their experiences. Um, and like the other categories, we're on the verge of a price drop here. Um, we've seen a lot of new entrants over the past uh, month and a half. Um, and we're going to see a whole bunch more at CES. Um, and we're going to see this, this field continue to get more and more crowded. Um, and of course, the big brands will be out of hold prices for a while, um, but then just like every other market that I talked about earlier, those brands will eventually um, see those prices drop to be able to compete with the newer brands. So Bluetooth and AMP Plus, um, you didn't think I was going to like skip this at some point. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's funny, in sports, um, I think a lot of people outside this room and outside you know, some of the industry um, believe it's an either or thing. Um, and I talked about last year, it's both. Um, I think what we're really seeing, especially in the devices of the last few weeks, is more of a convergence in some ways. Um, we're seeing devices using the technologies for the areas that make the most sense. Um, so using um, you know, each protocol um, in a way that, that makes most sense and combining with other protocols. For example, combining with Wi-Fi um, to connect to the internet um, as opposed to just saying it has to be either or. Um, I think we've seen pretty clearly over the last two months um, uh, you know, an example of a company that chose a given, a given uh, platform um, and the response that consumers have had um, in that company choosing that platform and not taking advantage of the platform. Um, so if you look at TomTom, Tom, for example, they, they went with Bluetooth Smart only for their, their runner multi-sport watches. Um, and you know, those watches compete well at that $200, $250 price range. Um, but the challenge with choosing only Bluetooth Smart wasn't that um, they just focused on that one technology. It's that they didn't actually leverage the technology. Um, so in their case, they're just using it for sensors, but they're not using it to connect to the phone. Um, so that somewhat calls into question the entire reason for using that. So if you look at um, you know, consumers out there that are looking to switch brands uh, from an AMP Plus device to their, that device, that loses the appeal. They have to buy their accessories, but they don't get anything to gain by it. They don't get the connectivity of the phone. They don't get connectivity out to the internet that people want. Um, so when you look at protocols, use them for the right ways. Use them um, the ways that make the most sense. Uh, I think long-term chipsets will solve some of these problems. Um, I think you know, some of the, the dual mode chipsets that we saw the last two days um, will solve a lot of these problems and, and continue that um, convergence between the, the two platforms. Um, in the meantime, we're seeing companies do creative things to solve that problem. Um, you know, PowerTap has replaceable caps um, where instead of having to buy a $1,000 plus power meter again because it switched from AMP Plus to Bluetooth Smart, um, they just pop out a $119 cap. Um, that's it. And you can go back and forth between the two. Um, that's consumer friendly. That's what consumers want. They want the assurance that um, they can easily go between the two technologies. Um, bridging through products like Viva and Reflect Plus um, are good examples of that. Um, and then Stages Power, which is simply dual transmitting. You can, go, you can do both. You can do AMP Plus, you can do Bluetooth Smart. It happens concurrently at the same time, and, and life is simple. Um, it's just it's what consumers want. They don't want to be um, caught into either one, either technology. 
So some of you saw, well, I should back up. So last Thursday, I was flying to, to Frankfurt on the flight, and it was like 10 o'clock at night, and I'm sitting there going, what am I going to post for tomorrow? And I went into my, and I was tired and exhausted, and I went into my, my drafts, and I found this old post I started writing way back in August um, based on conversations I had with many people at Europe, like around um, connectivity. Um, and it was several of those moments I was excited because, one, I realized I had the the convention this week and I can get data that would be useful for my slides and two, it was a 10 minute post, which means I could be done and, and ready to post and not have to write another hour or two of stuff. Um, and the, the survey was simple. It's, it asked three basic questions. Um, it talked about, do you use two or more devices? Um, and if so, do you use them at the same time? Um, and the point of that was to understand, were folks using AMP plus sensors to dual devices, dual display at the same time, um, because you can't do that today with Bluetooth Smart. You can't go ahead and have a AMP or a Bluetooth Smart heart rate strap and have it go to the phone and have it go to a secondary display device. Um, and you know, there's been a lot, of, a lot of discussion in this room and in other places around: is that a problem? Is that not a problem? And and I think, at least myself, I saw it as a fairly small problem. I. I Truly did. I didn't think it was a, a problem that warranted 29% of the marketplace. I thought it was, you know, the use case was a handful of people. Um, what I found out was actually the complete opposite. Um, so 3,056 people responded as of last night when I um, put the slide in here um, in just the last four days or so. 29% um, of those are using dual device at the same time. Um, so a lot of those are basically having a, a wrist strap on and they've got um, some other device, whether that's a, a gym device, it could be a, a biking computer, it could be something else. Some other device that's reading that AMP plus data um, or it could be reading, I, I mentioned also, you know, it could be some uh, polar analog data or something else there, um, wind data. Uh, but they're doing two devices at once. That's a, that's a big number. That's 30% of your market right there, um, doing two devices at once um, with, dis with uh, sensor data. Um, and that's something that, you know, just something to keep in mind as you look forward or look, uh, move forward on, on new products. It was also interesting, by the way, in that number too, is that um, that number stayed constant over the entire duration of the survey. Um, so that it was like 29.5%, 29.4%, and it stayed within a tenth of a percent from the morning I launched it until last night. Um, very, very constant, um, and across all the segments that I talked about earlier. Um, now the phone is really the central hub. We talked about that yesterday a little bit. Um, but I think the mistake that a lot of people make is assuming the phone is always your competitor. Um, and it's really not. Um, the phone is a way to broaden your device functionality. You've got to think about it that way. Um, if, you think, if you think about it as a competitor and don't engage the phone, you're going to lose the battle with the phone. Um, if you go ahead and give that phone a big old hug, um, then you're going to go ahead and be able to increase your, your functionality, increase um, your appeal of your device. Um, it, the, the simple reality is that people spend the entire day with a phone. Um, so if you can create apps that go ahead and exploit your device in a way to um, give it more functionality by just doing that on the phone, that's huge. Um, the, the important thing, though, is don't create an app for the sake of an app. The app actually has to do something valuable. Um, so the, the dirty little secret about my blog and app reviews is you almost never see an app review. Um, and this is for two reasons. One is practical in that apps are updated literally almost every week. Um, so if I go write an app review this week, um, and let's say I, I talk about three things that are, that are wrong with the app, by next week it could be fixed, which is arguably good for the app and good for the consumer, um, but now it makes that post completely irrelevant. And do I do that every single week with, with new, new apps? It's not practical. Um, but more importantly, the reason I don't like app reviews is that there are so many sucky apps. Um, and I generally don't like writing about sucky things because that means I'm wasting time where I could have been writing about cool things. Um, there are way too many fitness-based apps out there that just track where you went and how fast you were going and things like that. Really, we have enough of those. Um, if you're going to do an app, it's got to be kick-ass. It's got to be doing something cool and unique. It's got to be doing something that nobody else is doing, and it's got to be, got to be appealing. Um, even if it's a free app, if you can't qualify it with, yes, somebody would pay 10 or $20 for this app, probably not a good app. If you go to the best free apps in the marketplace today and ask those consumers, would you still pay 10 or $20 for that app? The best ones, people say yes. Um, the ones that just blah, they won't bother. Um, of course, phones are still fragile. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of phones today in the marketplace, if I were to um, 
drop it outside here, it's gonna, it's gonna be the end of that phone. Um, but we're seeing more and more phones that are now hardened. Um, that started a couple years ago with the, um, the time Sony Xperia active. Um, and I think we're gonna continue to see more phones that are, that are hardened for um, waterproofing and things like that, which is gonna continue to change the, the game a bit on devices and, and sports and, and outdoors. Um, so connectivity to the internet. Um, you know, 2013 has been a lot about connectivity through the phone and via the phone. Um, and that's sort of the entrance for our new products. We saw that at the very beginning of the year with the, the Garmin Edge 510, 810, um, and, and again renewed in the, the running sense over the last uh, couple weeks with a 620 and, and 220. Um, I think it's fair to say in 2014, if you're making a display device for running or cycling, um, it's got to connect to the phone as a starting point. That's a baseline requirement. If it's not connecting the phone and offering some sort of uploaded data there, um, you're not competitive. It's as simple as that. Um, I think though that soon in the future, 2014, late 2014, 2015, um, connectivity via the phone won't be the only requirement anymore. It's gonna be, I mean, there's already devices out there today that are, that are in the, the process of, of being publicly available um, that have that sort of connectivity straight to cellular networks. Um, that's where people want, especially the outdoors people, uh, want that connectivity direct from device. Just like we're going to see it in wearable displays, we're going to see it in other areas, it's short-circuiting that process. Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot of potential here um, with, with connected devices. We have competition and gamification, which are different things, by the way. Um, I, you know, we've seen a lot about gamification over the past few days. Competition is more around um, the Strava world, um, though Strava doesn't like competition in terms of that word from a legal standpoint, um, but that's what it is. That's, that's the reality of the situation. It's competition. It's people competing against other people, um, no matter how much lawyers want to tell us otherwise. Um, so those are two areas that can be taken advantage of. Um, if you look at gamification in the sports technology world today, there's zero. There's no legit gamification. Um, gamification, um, again, uh, to talk what Jim and I were talking about last night, is not um, somebody sitting there in front of a, a video replaying of a given ride on Alpduez. That's not gamification. That's just keeping you from being bored on your mind on a trainer for an hour and a half. Um, gamification is providing you some way to interact with, with the game and providing you goals and achievements, and that is true gamification. And there's nothing like that today in sports technology um, within the endurance sports world. Um, and of course, with connectivity comes ability to purchase add-ons, it comes ability for you to, to potentially upsell and, and increase your revenue, um, and it comes with ability to integrate with third-party platforms. Um, and I'm gonna talk about third-party here in just a second. So web service integration APIs, and talk about some things that are, aren't maybe as, as exciting, but um, they are really, really important. Um, if you're offering a device, and if that device has a service on the interwebs somewhere, um, you need to offer an API or a web service to allow people to connect to it. It's as simple as that. Um, that, that API web service needs to be documented, it needs to be updated, it needs to be transparent. Um, and I simply will not recommend devices that don't have that. Um, I also won't take an IOU for it either. Um, so if, if you come to me at, at product launch and say, yes, we're going to have it three months from now, I don't believe you. Because I know that when it comes time for you to balance features between adding something that can provide you revenue and provide you a marketing bullet and adding an API, this is gonna win every single time in your discussions internally. And the user and the consumer will lose out on it. And that's not what they want. It's very, very clear, and the consumers have said this. This past summer, Strava um, basically ripped out their API across the board. Um, and in doing so, upset a lot of third-party app developers. Um, but more importantly, they upset a lot of the users of those third parties. Those users were ultimately using Strava. Um, those third parties were basically doing things that built on top of Strava and expanded Strava and expanded the footprint. Um, I wrote a post about it um, back in July. Um, that post had over a thousand shares on different social media platforms, a thousand shares. That eclipsed almost all of my product review posts on a given product. Um, meaning that if I looked at something like the, the Garmin Forerunner um, 220, 620 post from two weeks ago, which was huge, this was bigger. That's, people were really upset about this. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments on this post with people basically saying, you know what, I'm pulling out of Strava because of the yanking of third party and uh, API support. Since then, Strava's kind of come back to the table a little bit. Um, they've gone ahead and they've added uh, a lot of those developers back into the process again, um, and they've kind of increased some of their, their transparency around their API. Um, 
But let that be a bit of a signal, though, to other companies. I mean, if, if Strava is one of the biggest ones in that, that marketplace today as an online web service, um, can receive that much backslash or backlash, then so can any other company. Um, it's really, really important. Um, and then lastly, for some of you, not all of you, but some of you, realize that you're a device maker first and probably a software company second. In other words, open up that API, open up that access, and allow other companies to really make your device um, look awesome. Um, you don't have to solve the entire world at once. You can go ahead and, and let other companies have a piece of that as well. Ultimately, they're still buying your, your device, and that's what you want. So standard, standardization. Um, there are two areas of standardization. You know, I started four years ago, I talked about file format standards, um, and I'm really excited that in the last four years of pounding this in, um, I think it's finally set. I think, um, with the exception of one company, um, everyone is using the same file format standards. Um, they're all using, or you're all using almost across the board, .fit files, and you're almost all doing it correctly, um, and that's, that's huge. That means that you can take those devices and um, upload those files to any service you want, and it makes it easier for the consumer. Um, connectivity standards, uh, that scenario still got some work to do on. Um, you know, I, some of you may have read some of my Interbike posts. Um, there was a company there that did some stuff via private ant. Um, I don't think they got a terribly pleasant post out of it. Um, and, and the reason wasn't because they, they had a product that was bad. Um, it was because they had a product that siloed itself. Um, and they had a product that didn't interact with all of your products and didn't give the rest of the ecosystem or even the consumer the ability to truly use that product. Um, and all they had to do was use AMP Plus. If they had used AMP Plus as opposed to Private Ant in their case, um, it would have been a completely different story because then all of your products could have taken advantage of that and done some really cool stuff. Instead, it's this little tiny island unto itself. So, three rules of standardizations. I don't care about your excuses. Meaning, if you come to me and say that, well, we're going to support fit, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do that, or we can't do it yet because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I look at some of the products that have gone out without the support, and people have blatantly said on the comments, until this is there, I'm not buying it. It's as simple as that. Um, so you have to have the right file format standards out there from the get-go. And as I said, consumers don't care about your excuses. They don't care about whatever internal, you know, the excuse you have for the reason why you can't support a file format standard, it's got to be dot fit. Um, and of course, refer to numbers rules number one and two if you have any questions at all. Um, one important thing to note on um, CSV files in Excel, that's not a standard. That is a file format. It's not a standard. And the reason that's important to understand is that if you export out in CSV, that doesn't give anybody anything. That just gives them raw data. I can't upload a random CSV from your company to Strava. I can't upload it to Training Peaks. I can't upload it to any other service out there because those services don't understand how to use your data. So you have to write it in something that they understand. They understand fit. They understand .tcx. They don't understand a random CSV file unless it's written in a format that mirrors some other company, in which case you might as well just do fit. So. Last year, I had four products up there that I talked about that excited me for the upcoming year. Um, I figured I'd just recap where those were and where they've gone over the last year. Um, the Wahoo Kicker was on the list. Um, I think it's fair to say the Wahoo Kicker has done pretty well. Um, I think it's fair to say they've changed the, the industry within the, the trainer world. Um, I don't think there's any doubts about that. Um, next was the, the Viva Heart Race Trap. Um, I think we've seen a lot of interesting things down there. I think we've seen a lot of consumers excited about it. Um, I think over the last, you know, especially the last three or four months, we've seen a bit of pickup there. Um, I think there's still ways to go in terms of how that, that product could be leveraged. Um, but I think that's, that's definitely changed the market in some areas over the past year. Um, the Wahoo Reflect was on the list. Um, I would say this one hasn't necessarily done as well as the kicker in terms of um, how it's potentially changing the industry. I think it may be um, a bit soon for that product um, in terms of getting apps to, to adopt it. Um, I think the longer term, I think with the Reflect Plus, for example, um, kind of adding in the things that people are looking for in terms of AMP Plus and barometric altimeter, that could kind of shift that landscape a bit. Um, but I mean, like I said earlier, with smart displays, the Reflect was a smart display. Um, that's still going to be um, a definitely a hot area going forward. In the stages power meter, um, that's the 699 direct force power meter. No doubt that changed things in the power meter world over the last year. Um, it got off to a really rocky start, but they fixed some stuff by summer or so. Um, and as a result, I think we saw um, some pretty significant pricing changes coming from PowerTap and, and others uh, because of that. So I think it's fair to say that made a big, big impact on things. Looking forward to next year, 
here are five things that I think are really interesting to watch. Um, first one is the SRM PC8. This may actually surprise some folks as to why this is on here, um, knowing me, I think. The, the reason this is exciting to me is because it has AMP Plus, it has Bluetooth Smart, it has Wi-Fi. Um, in talking with the team, they've really sat down and talked through some of the scenarios, talked through not only normal consumer scenarios, but team scenarios, the Tour de France. Um, they've leveraged technologies in the right way. Um, they said, you know what, we're going to connect to eight SRM um, bike computers in a, next to a tour bus um, via Wi-Fi first. If Wi-Fi is not available, we'll try Bluetooth Smart. Um, and they've, they've kind of thought through these scenarios. Now, it's still a long way. The, the release is not until next spring sometime. Um, but if they can execute on what they've talked about, um, I think this could be a really interesting product, um, albeit at a very, very high price point, still a very, very interesting product. Um, AMP Plus Trainer Profile, I talked about that quite a bit earlier on. That's going to be a huge thing next year. Um, Recon Jet, I also talked about earlier on. I think that's going to be very interesting to watch. Um, the, the Garmin Forerunner 620 with the Running Dynamics, um, I think this could be an interesting area to watch because Running Dynamics are, it's a, a topic that people don't really know anything about yet. Um, so I think it would be fascinating to see what that data looks like over the next you know, couple years if people start to use it. Um, so I see that as starting a bit of a, a trend there. Um, that said, there are other companies that are looking to do running dynamic-like things, and I would like to see that there be um, standards there and basically an AMP Plus profile used so that it's um, common across the board. I think that's beneficial to not only Garmin, but I think it's beneficial to the entire industry um, if you're using standards, just like every other device profile out there. Um, and then lastly, um, Moxie. I think Moxie is sort of like the running dynamics. We don't quite know yet how we're going to use all this data in training and racing, but the potential there is fascinating. Um, and that's, you know, it's all got to start somewhere, um, and that'd be interesting and seeing how this does over the next year. So outside of those products, there are four areas that I'm kind of watching for 2014. Um, number one is risk-based heart rate monitoring. We saw that in the presentation right before this. Um, I think, you know, I don't think next year will be the year of risk-based heart rate monitoring. I think it's probably another year or two away. Um, we've had some products on the market today um, that, are, that are good products, but they, they, the problem is they're on both sides of that gap. You have one product that's, that's very good in sports and fitness, um, but it doesn't have necessarily all the features of a typical uh, GPS watch. Um, and then you have another product that's very good for the other 20 three hours of the day, um, but it can't run 100 meters on the street without having bad data. Um, so we've got to see more convergence in those two, um, and that's where I think there's some fascinating stuff that could happen over the next year or so. Um, more gamification than I talked about earlier. Um, I think we'll see greater use of accelerometers. We're already seeing that over the past year. Um, accelerometers are just the beginning of things, whether they're to do error correction or they're to do um, recognition of calories and activities and things like that. Um, that's a ton of potential still there. Um, and then finally, better use of connectivity. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of scenarios there for connecting from the device to um, the internet. Um, biggest challenges here in this segment is just got to work. It's the, the just work factor has to increase. Um, it's really good. It's gotten really good over the last year, um, but it still has a little ways to go for some devices that just got to work. Um, pricing to compete with mobile in the areas that you do compete, um, there's the reality of that. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, user interface. Um, a lot of the sports and fitness devices today look a little 1980s. Um, and that turns off some users. Um, I think the same is true when you look at some of the apps out there, especially on the Android side. Um, I would say the Android apps in sports and fitness lag significantly behind the iPhone apps from a UI standpoint. Um, that's something that's got to be addressed. Um, standardization in the areas that I've talked about earlier, and then integration across platforms. Um, people want integration. It's as simple as that. They want to buy your device. They want to use it with Training Peak, Strava, Daily Mile, or whatever service they want. Enable that to happen. What consumers want from you, number one, timely updates. Um, they want updates on a regular release cadence. We saw Sunto do this um, over the past couple years. Um, they didn't give away their entire roadmap. Um, they just talked about the things they were, up, they were going to update. Um, willingness to take feedback, whether that's feedback on features that you're missing or feedback on um, our bugs going ahead and getting those addressed. Um, and if those things are public, then going ahead and say, yeah, we're going to go and fix these. We're going to make these happen. That's what consumers are looking for. They just want communication. They just want to know when something's going to get fixed um, and, and or even if it's going to get fixed. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. And then, of course, answering questions through your various forums. If you have or forums or social media channels, if you have forums, you should probably visit those forums. Um, you should probably answer questions in your own forums. Um, and the same is true as on Twitter and Facebook. If you have Twitter and Facebook, um, accounts and you're broadcasting out something there, you should also respond to questions there as well um, as best as possible. 
So I always get questions on kind of ways to work with me. I'm just going to do two quick slides to explain this um, on, on types of reviews I do. I kind of have three basic categories of reviews. Um, and the first two aren't really reviews. Um, the first one's called first look posts. These are posts that I typically write when I go to Eurobike or Interbike or even here, for example, that I'll sit down with you and I'll talk about your technology, I'll talk about how it works, um, but it's not a review. I'm, I'm generally, in those cases, not even taking a device home with me. I'm simply just talking about how it works in the same way um, another or more traditional media would do that, except I'm doing it in a, a detailed way. Um, initial hands-on, this is usually a case where the company um, didn't have the product ready until the very last second, or the product may not be uh, RTM'd yet. So in that case, um, I'm usually looking at a device just a couple days before launch um, and playing with the device, and then just posting kind of initial hands-on look. Basically, this is playing with the device, giving some, some initial thoughts on it, but not doing a full review. And then finally, the full in-depth review um, of a final product. And I've, I've sort of changed a bit of my methodology of last year, where I'm now focusing on those in-depth reviews happening only on final hardware and software. Um, I simply had too many cases over the past uh, while where um, I'll use a beta device, write an in-depth review on that device that may be almost final, and then we find out you know, two weeks later that the final firmware um, drop introduces new bugs that weren't there in the beta drop that I had, and now we've got you know, things that are worse than they were um, in a beta situation. So I've kind of said, you know what, I'm not going to do final in-depth reviews until um, your device and software is final. Typical test cycle, um, discussions about the product that can happen up to a year in advance sometimes, um, and ensuring the product is a proper fit for my audience. Um, I don't review nutrition stuff, I don't review a lot of things that are, you know, on the, the edge of the endurance sports world, I just focus on sports technology. Um, if it's got a, like a chip in it, that's kind of a good way to start. Um, product arrives, I've got unboxing, initial use. I'm usually using the product for one to three months. I'm going ahead and I'm, I'm basically beating the crap out of it. Um, I, break products all the time, um, and that's just that's the way it works. I'm treating it like a consumer would, um, and I'm working with you behind the scenes to understand how the product works. I'm um, answering questions about it or asking you questions about it. Uh, my goal is to understand the product end-to-end -end and include a very accurate post. Um, those of you that have had reviews know that the morning of the review, I always send a follow-up email that simply says, if there's anything technically inaccurate at the post, please let me know and I'll correct it immediately. Uh, my goal is to have the most accurate post out there with the most information. It's as simple as that. Um, and then finally, publication, um, a post publish. Um, and then that, when that, once that happens, obviously people ask questions. Um, you know, recent posts had 400 questions and comments on the first day alone. Um, so my goal is to answer those questions as best as possible. Um, and some of them I'll have to go back to you as a company. Um, and then some companies actually are active in, in the, my product review posts. Um, so within the Ant Plus crowd, that includes uh, Wahoo, Four Eyes, um, Cycleops, uh, Kinomap, I'm sure I'm missing many more, I apologize, um, that are very, very active, uh, be cool, um, and, and respond to questions on my post itself, and I love that. The consumers love that because it shows engagement, it shows people can get detailed answers they probably couldn't get through a marketing channel somewhere else. So with that, the, the three methods that I use are one, I do NDA discussions with people, so if you have uh, products that you are not willing to publicly talk about, I'm happy to talk about them under NDA. Um, I am happy to do products launched or product announcements to your product launches that are timed to that. And then finally, I, I do reviews that are after the product has launched. So if you've already launched something and you want me to review it, then we can talk about that. Understand though that in the grand scheme of the totem pole, um, that's relatively low compared to things that have finite dates on them. Um, so just keep that in mind. So with that, I am here till tomorrow morning. So if you'd like to, like to chat, I'm happy to do that anytime between now and 11 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you very much.